Hi, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of the Momentum Velocity Club Masterclass Series. Thank you so much for joining us. Velocity Club helps professionals like yourself achieve their success through personalized financial advice. Now, although we help you manage your money better and align it to the financial goals that you have, we do realize that it's not only about managing the money, it's also about making it. And that's why today we have Sihle Polani. And if you are familiar with Usihle, you know that she's very intentional about having necessary conversations and sometimes even a bit uncomfortable um, in order to equip us on the tools we need to navigate this corporate jungle. Sihle is the CEO of Sihle Polani Consulting. She is a writer, a strategist, a podcaster, and the list goes on and on. And she's here to tell us how we can achieve the career of our dreams. Thank you so much for joining us, Sihe. Thank you so much for having me. You know, it's so exciting to be a part of this conversation, particularly because it's so important for, for corporates to be at the forefront of these types of conversations, because essentially that's where we spend most of our time. Right. Um, I completely, completely agree with you. Guys, it's going to be an interesting one. Um, in the nuggets that I've gotten from OCK in our conversation prior to this, I've definitely taken away a lot. So I can imagine what she's going to spit out in this conversation today. So make sure you have your notepads out, you're listening and you're watching in and you don't miss out on a thing. So Sita, I always like starting right at the beginning because I always want myself and everybody else to be on the same page in terms of what it is that we are speaking about. So I thought we could kickstart the conversation on just discussing what is the difference. So today we're talking about how to build the career of your dreams, right? But what is the difference between a career and a job, if there is a difference? So at it's very core cool and at a high level, um, a job is something that you just do for money, right? You're just making ends meet. You're just meeting your bare necessities. Whereas a career is something that you work on and build upon on a long-term basis. So if in a career, you have long-term goals that you're working towards um, and you equip yourself to be able to achieve those goals and advance through the ranks in your profession. It's also about making employment decisions that are connected and strategically aligned to your goals. So that map that you draw up for yourself from how do you get from this first position to where you ultimately want to end up is what really differentiates it. Whereas a job is literally just, this is what I'm doing. And I don't foresee anything beyond that at this particular point. Mm. So it's a journey. I love how everything always aligns to the things that we always preach about, which is progression, which is planning, which is having something mapped out in terms of this is step one and this is step two. And I think you've explained it to all of us quite well. Now that we understand a bit better um, what it is that we are talking about, we previously, in the previous episode of our, our Masterclass series, we discussed how to turn your passion into profit, right? And a lot of people are moving towards, or rather like would like to and would love to move towards actually making careers out of the things that they enjoy and their passions. So I'm very interested to know from you and your career experience and perspective, as well as your career coach perspective, how important do you think it is for us to actually enjoy the work we do in order to build a sustainable career? It's absolutely critical because it impacts on the quality of our life. So often we focus on being successful professionally, but we don't see the importance of being successful personally. And obviously that success in their personal capacity is going to mean something different for everyone. And the reality is that for many people, that successful fulfillment within your job is not necessarily going to be what you want it to be. Or your fulfillment in life may not necessarily come from your job. So professional fulfillment is a critical part of the human experience, right? Because we're not one dimensional, one dimensional people. You're not just Andy, so the client success lead, you know, there's so much more to you. Um, and so job satisfaction and a sense of meaningful accomplishment are very important components of the human experience. But what we need to understand is that for many people, um, there aren't careers that they were either pressured into by their parents. So you have to study medicine, you have to become a lawyer, you have to you know, do a specific thing or be in a specific field. 
Um, for other people, they may have excelled in particular subjects at school. And then it's like, well, you're really great at science. So why don't you go and study something to do with biomedicine? Or why don't you go and study something, to, you know, purely because they just happen to be good at a particular subject. And for other people, um, you know, it may be a case of feeling at the time like, okay, this particular career is lucrative right now and I need to make money. Um, and so this is the field that I'm gonna go into. And for other people, many people, and particularly black people in South Africa, the decision to join an organization or to pursue a particular career or take on a particular job is really fueled by the need for survival. What we need to understand is that being good at something doesn't guarantee that you'll find it fulfilling. There are many people who are excellent at their jobs, but they're unhappy, they're unfulfilled. And so we have a world with lots of people walking around unfulfilled because their work doesn't fuel their passions or stir their curiosity um, or enable them to explore their creativity. Somehow when we're adults, we're grown-ups, we believe that creativity is something that we shouldn't even be bothering with because that's for children. Coloring in is for children. Playing with Legos is for children, you know? Um, and we're also starting to see the trend around the rates of burnout, which are steadily increasing because yes, work can be taxing, but the real exhaustion at the core is not being able to do the things that give us joy or that make us feel alive. And we underestimate just how much that steals away from us and our ability to enjoy a good quality of life. And so we what we feel is a kind of tiredness that you can't sleep away. You know, you can spend an entire weekend in bed and Monday comes around and you still just feel like it was just Friday the other day because we're not fulfilled in what we're doing. It's a tired that is urging you to go within and invest in discovering what truly sets your soul on fire. For some people, that might mean getting a new job or a new career. For other people, it might mean exploring a side hustle because both can exist and be true at the same time. You can have a job that you're good at, uh, that you're successful in, but that doesn't fulfill you, but you get your fulfillment from that side hustle. For other people, it means have discovering that you actually have a passion for different projects or for community service and pouring your time into that outside of the workplace. So when people have a regular source of joy and fulfillment in their lives, they give much more of themselves to their other spaces because their cup is full. So they go above and beyond, particularly in the workplace. And I think it's also important to note that as much as it each and every one of us has a responsibility to explore what it is that gives us joy, to spend that time with ourselves, to learn about ourselves, to reconnect with ourselves. It's also a challenge to everyone who manages people to take the time to understand each individual team member, understand what are their aspirations? Because your interest in them and your care establishes trust. And that trust boosts morale and effectiveness within the organization. Mm. I love how you said that uh, being great at something doesn't necessarily mean that you are passionate at that specific thing and that's where you should be going. Because you're right, we make career decisions based on a lot of reason, especially the survival one, you know, um, what is the market saying? What, where are you most, um, you know, likely to get a job or secure something permanent? And that, that can drive what you end up doing. And this, the set your soul and fire is, is one of the, 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 the terms that you use that I really, really love a lot. Because that's when, like you said, you're able to pour in and you're able to give and you're able to extend yourself because you're truly passionate about what it is that you are doing. So speaking about this passion, enjoying your work and then being in the in the work environment. So often when you um, get into a job and you have this position that you are in, you apply with a job description in mind or rather you are even given this when you get in. Right. And those are the things that you are expected to do. Now, so if I is, is my if I want to progress in my career and I want to really make it successful, is it a matter of me doing great at this job description? Is, a, is it a matter of me making sure that I put everything in myself to do what is required of me? Is that enough to, to have a successful career and a sustainable career? Or do you think there are other things that I should be doing? And if there are other things, maybe shed some light on what those things are. That's a really great question. And I think it's something that 
all of us at some point in our careers, or maybe some still believe um, is actually the way things are, that your job description is the be all and end all of what is required of you in the organization and in order for you to advance in your career. I certainly in the earlier stages of my career believed, well, I've ticked all the boxes, so surely success should follow, right? Um, but the reality is that your job description is merely a guideline for what is required for you to get your job done on a day-to-day -day basis. It's by no means an exhaustive breakdown of your responsibilities. You have to take that and build on it and make it your own, right? So understand that the job description is just the bare minimum. So asking yourself questions like, how can I amplify this job description? Ask your line manager, what does success look like for this role? Be an active driver of conversations about your career. So often the mistake that we make is we wait for our line managers to be the ones who say, okay, so you've been in this role for a year. The next step for you is A, B, C, D. And in most cases, they don't. They don't even bring it up. All they do is focus on whether or not you've delivered according to your KPIs and they give you a rating and that's the end of the process and you move on to the next year. Four years, five years down the line, you find yourself still stuck in the same role and you have no idea what the next steps are, whether or not you're going to progress or move on to the next level or what that next level even is. So it's so important for you to be the one who initiates and drives those conversations on a consistent basis. It's also important to be able to ask your line manager, from where I am now, what is the next step for me, right? Um, what skills and development are required to equip me to successfully fulfill that role? And then you need to look at your current skill set. What are your skills gaps and what can you do to bridge them? And then ask about opportunities to contribute to other projects, whether it's in your immediate team or in other teams, because this allows you to expand your range of skills, but it also allows you to build a network outside of your immediate team. Because as we are now learning, visibility plays a major role in positioning you for opportunities for growth and specialized development within the organization. So yes, it's important to work on developing your technical skills, but that's just one component. What many people don't realize is the importance of also developing your transferable skills. So your transferable skills are the skills that you can literally take with you that are not directly related to necessarily the job that you're doing. So they're not specialized skills or technical skills, but are skills that can be applied should you choose to change careers or should you choose to change industries. And what they essentially do is they open you up to options that are available to you should you wish to switch career paths. They also expose you to other areas of interest. Um, and you may find that in exploring these transferable skills, you may actually discover new passions that bring you into alignment with your purpose, this purpose that everyone is actively trying to pursue, right? As a coach, I get so many questions about how do I discover my purpose? And it's not something that lands on your lap, right? You don't wake up one day and go, aha, uh -huh, you know? There it is. Um, <laughs> It, got it. <laughs> um, it requires you to have an open mind and to step outside of the usual humdrum of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's so important for you to consider what could you be learning outside of your technical skills that will help you to open up the opportunities that are available to you because it makes your world so much bigger. The other thing that's important um, to bear in mind is that you shouldn't be afraid of starting anew. It's not a sign of failure. It's just saying to yourself that you're choosing yourself and you're choosing something different for yourself. And that is absolutely okay. Career pivots are becoming more and more common as people discover new passions, new talents, um, new interests, and when they seek to venture into new careers and new industries. It really is about choosing to put yourself first. It's also important um, to be diligent about self-management, right? Um, it's important to ensure that when you are in the workplace, that the way in which you present yourself, the way in which you do your work shows people that you are reliable. 
it's important to invest in ensuring that you're delivering good quality work consistently and you meet your deadlines because the relationship between employers and employees is one that is very much about give and take. Both parties have to give and take. And it is important for you to be able to hold up your end of the bargain if you want to be able to benefit within that organization through advancement, through your remuneration, um, through opportunities for development, et cetera, et cetera. Because we do have to prove ourselves. We do have to show our value within the organization because that's the language that organizations understand. And if you, particularly if you're wanting to be negotiating for promotions, et cetera, et cetera, you have to be able to have this, uh, this evidence to back you up, to show that actually you do have the capacity and the ability to be able to take on those new opportunities. The other thing that's important is to treat everyone with respect. Nobody is better than you. Nobody, well, nobody's better than you, but also nobody is below you. Um, the other skill, which many of us struggle with because we attach our value to what we do. We attach our value to our job descriptions or our job titles. And what that then does is that it makes it very difficult for us to be able to receive feedback that we perceive as negative. And so it makes it very difficult to be in a space where you can give and receive feedback effectively in the workplace. It also makes it very difficult to develop healthy conflict management skills because everything is personal to us, right? We get so caught up in dealing with the who as opposed to the what, but being able to develop your personal skills, being able to deal with your own issues and your own baggage, being able to watch your ego, being able to check when your ego shows up and what triggers it is what empowers you to be able to show up in those conversations that are uncomfortable in a way that is healthier, in a way that is more empowered, in a way that enables you to see those opportunities as opportunities for learning and for your personal growth. The other thing that's really, really important is being able to set and uphold boundaries in the workplace. And this is something that many people struggle with. Um, the fear of setting boundaries because you're worried about the negative consequences as a result thereof. So some people, maybe your, your employment contract says that you work from 8.30 to 4.30 or to 5. Um, and you know that you go home, you spend time with your kids, you make dinner, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not available beyond that time. Uh, but your line manager calls you, um, they want to check on stuff or they want you to check an email or they want you to send an email, et cetera, et cetera. And you're unable to say, I'm not available at this time. Can I get to it in the morning, right? And what that does is that it then begins to build resentment. And when people are resentful in the workplace, they don't give of their best. They are not engaged as employees and they don't feel psychologically safe within that environment. And so when you decide to empower yourself and go into that conversation with your line manager from the time you join the organization to say, okay, what are the terms of engagement in our relationship? This is what I can do. Are you comfortable with that? Where do we meet each other halfway? So that you take away that risk of conflict because you did not communicate your expectations and ensure that they're on the same page with you as well. The other thing that's important, obviously, is having compassion in the workplace and also asking for help. Nobody knows everything. Yeah. Asking for help doesn't make you weak, and it doesn't mean that you're not deserving to be in the role that you're in. And it certainly doesn't mean that, um, you know, you are not as smart as everybody else. It is not possible for any of us to know everything all the time. Ask for help. We can only be better for it. And it also gives you an opportunity to connect more deeply with your, with your colleagues uh, within the organization. And it really just helps the connectedness of the team and the effectiveness of the team when you're able to lean on and, and lean on and rely on each other in times of need. Another important point is networking. I know so many of us, and particularly as black folk are told, just when you start working, just do your work, keep your head down, and don't cause any trouble, don't do anything, you know, don't, don't stick out like a sore thumb, just, you know, do what you have to do. 
speak when spoken to, yes sir, no sir, no ma'am, yes ma'am, you know, that whole shebang. But actually that works to our detriment because nobody knows who you are and nobody knows what you do. So networking is incredibly important in the, in the workplace. Make yourself known to influential people in the organization. Make sure they know what you do and the value that you add. Show that you're already thinking about the organization's future and how potential changes can be addressed early or how opportunities can be leveraged. So I often have clients who will say, but how do I do that? How do I just go to a senior person that I don't know um, and position myself and tell them who I am and what I do? And there are very simple tricks that you can use to do this. For instance, you can go and have you can be in a meeting and a senior executive in that meeting. And after the meeting, you might go to, to them and say, you know, um, I really like what you said in the meeting about A, B, C, D. And actually it speaks to what I've been thinking about. And these are my thoughts. What are your thoughts? Can we set up 10 minutes for a coffee session? Because I'd really like to run some ideas past you to see if my thinking is in line with the direction the organization is taking. Or stalk them. There's LinkedIn, there's Twitter, find out what their interests are and hook onto that. So you send an email, oh, hey, Mark, I see that actually you're an avid runner. I'm interested in actually starting up running, you know, to get into shape and all of that, but I have no idea where to begin. Yeah, five minutes to just share with me a few tips that might help me get started on this journey, you know? And so it creates an opportunity for you to get that first engagement. And then you can then start going into the conversations about the work stuff. So always look for a hook because people respond well to you when you show an interest in them, right? People are very ego driven. So if you show me that I'm important to you somehow, I'm more likely to listen to what you have to say. Or if you show me that you are going to add value to me first, then I'm much more willing to add value in return. And that's just the nature of human dynamics. Um, and then the other thing that's important to always remember is to speak up in meetings. So often we go into meetings, we listen, we're too afraid to say what we think because we're afraid it's not smart enough. We're afraid our ideas will get uh, rejected. We're afraid of being embarrassed, um, et cetera, et cetera. But your voice and your contributions matter and are necessary. That's why you're there. There's a reason why you're in that role. You have value to add and you need to trust that and you need to trust yourself and trust that you belong in those rooms. Because if you're not using your voice, if people don't go into a meeting and know that, oh, Sika's gonna have something to say. We don't know what, but she's definitely gonna have something to say. Or even Sika's gonna be in that meeting. People knowing that you're in that room because you contribute actively is such an important um, strategic tactic to be able to position yourself um, as somebody who's valuable in having conversations that help move the organization forward or that help make decisions that are necessary for the organization. And the last part for this question that I want to mention is around, and this is on a more personal basis, working on changing your internal dialogue. You know, there are phrases such as imposter syndrome, which are widely used and we understand why, right? We understand why they exist. We understand what they're trying to communicate. But the reality is that we're not imposters. And if we continue to take ownership of this term, we are continuing to tell ourselves and to tell our subconscious minds that we don't belong. The root of the issue and the actual problem is that we have to navigate our way through spaces that were never created with our inclusion in mind. And sometimes those spaces make us feel unwelcome, but that is not a burden for us to carry. We are not the problem. Those systems and cultures are, so don't allow them to make you shrink yourself. Sure. Um, so I like, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody is, is getting lost in these nuggets. There's so much to take away. And I think the reality of everything you mentioned is hitting home for each and, and every one of us, um, regardless of which aspect of our careers we're actually looking at. And I think I'm finding a lot of similarities between your career journey and your financial journey in the sense that what you are saying to me, or rather what I'm hearing is you need to own this journey. It is yours. There's a lot of 
you need to do this, whether you are networking, whether you are asking the right questions, whether you are engaging, you are showing your contribution and your value in spaces that you need to by speaking up. But I think the gist of it is we need to own our journeys. It is your career journey. And I think often we think that, like you said, you walk into an organization and miraculously this career is going to be mapped out for you with exactly what to do. And, you know, maybe that comes from um, our schooling environment and our background where we were given information and we just had to give it back um, for assessment and we get caught up in that way of, of working. And then when you get in and you realize that there's something that you have to do, I think it becomes quite real. So speaking about these journeys, um, I'm very interested to know how, how have you viewed now talking about the money? And I said earlier that the reason why we have these conversations at Velocity Club is because we do help people manage money, but we also understand that making it is important. But I'm interested to know in your journey and experience, how has the way that you view money changed um, from where you were previously, perhaps in corporate, to where you are now? And what are some of the lessons that you have felt were critical um, in how you take your future forward and how you progress to build your career or even life decisions in general? Well, I think, you know, the biggest shift for me was adjusting to the shift from the comfort of a monthly salary to the, the, the uncertainty that comes with entrepreneurship. I mean, I left corporate at the end of 2015 um, and I left because I was in a toxic environment. So I left with no job. I had no plan. Um, I had always been a corporate communication strategist. I was heading up uh, communications uh, for one of the financial services institutions. And I found myself in a space where I was just like, okay, um, I have bills to pay. I don't have money. What am I going to do? I have a child to take care of. There were so many things um, that I needed to think of, but I'd never had an opportunity to think about life as an entrepreneur and what that would require from me and how that would need to change the way in which I manage my finances. Um, but over the years, um, and obviously also through just education and trying to be smarter about money, um, because it's very easy to fall into the trap of now you're in business and so you're making money and so hey, hey, lifestyle, you know? Um, but the real shift for me was Firstly, the big one was being able to work my way completely out of debt. So being debt free. And I'm, you know, so, so proud of that. You know, it's a well huge done. burden. Well the shoulders. <laughs> but the other thing for me was really thinking a lot more about the future as opposed to the now. And so for me, my priorities now are about um, investments. You know, how do I make sure that my money is working for me? you know, and not me working for my money all the time. Um, and because for me, it's important for my children to not be starting at base minus seven, you know, when they begin their lives, they have to be set, they have to be better than okay. Well, you know, when they go into adulthood. But the other thing for me that was really important was understanding the importance of investing back into my business as opposed to just getting excited about getting money in and you know thinking that's just money that I can use for different things but actually using that to build my business using that to create content using that to buy equipment for podcasting buying lights buying all of these things so that that contributes to what I can continue to create within my business um, and the value that I can add to the people who are part of my community um, and so those are really the the, the major things for me that stand out as far as, as money is concerned. And then also really being able to be in a position where no matter what is happening, prioritizing paying myself every month, you know, paying myself a salary, no matter how things look, um, because it's important for me to also be able to get the value that I need out of the business that I'm creating and trusting that things will fall into place. Yeah, I think we always say that money is, is not the only important thing, but I think we can't argue um, the value that it has and how it enables us in so many different ways, whether it's securing your future, like you say, or just growing your business and saving for that for whatever it is. 
But I think that often sometimes we, ne we don't necessarily know what questions to ask ourselves when it comes to money. And well done on paying off your bad debt, by the way. That's one of the things we really advocate for. Um, you know, you should really give yourself a round of applause. I'm giving yourself a round of applause because it's, it's a great achievement and it's a great place to start because then it enables you, um, you know, to have this disposable income that you can now use towards the things that you really want to achieve. Guys, we're going to share a link to a couple of questions that you can complete in a questionnaire. And this link basically gives you the opportunity to answer some questions and find out what is your next best move? Is it paying off your debt? Is it starting to save? Is it building an emergency fund because you want to have that comfort or that cushion that you have should something happen? What is your next best financial move and how can we as Velocity Club actually help and partner with you in order to achieve those goals? Whether it's start a business, whether it's secure your family's future, whatever it is. Like I said, money is not the most important thing, but it does matter because it enables so much and enables you to get um, you know, that business that you want to build it up with the savings that you have and all those other things. So we're definitely going to share that link. And I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, here are so many insights. When can, where can we get more? You know, where can we get more? So please make sure that you join our Facebook group, which is the Velocity Club Success Seekers. Sikha will be dropping some nuggets. Um, one of them is we asked her, how do we make sure that, um, you know, we negotiate our salaries successfully? And she's going to be on answering that question in our Velocity Club Success Seekers group. So make sure you're a part of that and you do get insight into that information because you don't want to miss out. And Sikha, back to the corporate part now, financial lessons, career lessons, and all of these things. Um, what, what had you learned in your time at corporate? Because I know often some of us can feel like, you know, I'm very frustrated. I'm very tired. Um, you know, this is uncomfortable. Is it really worth it? I don't like this job. But what are some of the things that you took away from your experience at corporate and lessons that you felt that you needed to learn because they better equipped you for whatever was following in your future? Mm. I love that question because, you know, as much as the, the, the last part of my experience in corporate was very, very unpleasant, I wouldn't trade my corporate experience for anything in the world because there's so much that I learned, you know, just as, as a base for anything that is related to work. And some of the things like, for instance, learning how to have structure is so, so important when you're gonna be starting your own business. Learning how to create and manage processes within your organization so that you are professional at all times. Uh, understanding risk management, um, understanding how to work with different types of stakeholders, how to manage those relationships effectively. Um, professional writing. We underestimate the importance of being able to write and communicate, communicate professionally in writing. Some of the things that people send in emails are shocking because they simply don't invest in the skill to be able to articulate themselves effectively in writing, which also influences how you articulate yourself verbally. Um, and having been a communications professional, um, you know, I've done a lot of training for, for public speaking. And so that in, enables me to be able to do things like this and to communicate with people um, in a way in which uh, they're able to connect with the message that I'm sharing with them. The other thing that's important is really around being able to manage crises because things happen all the time and being able to manage crises without losing your head, uh, having being in a position where you're able to come up with a plan B, to think on your feet, to troubleshoot is so, so important working well with others, being consistent, uh, developing strategies. You know, developing a strategy is something that's very difficult and very technical. And you have to actually invest the time in learning how to create a strategy or create a business plan. And those things are so important to be able to give structure to your business. It's also important um, to be able to review your performance and outcomes within your business, right? You're not just winging it. You have to be able to know how you're performing and where you need to make amendments as necessary. And the experience in corporate enabled me to be able to have an objective view on how I'm actually performing and the changes that I need to make for my business to be successful. And the other thing is really around accountability, holding myself accountable because I'm not motivated every day. I don't want to do this work every day. 
I don't wake up every single morning and go, yes, this is it. Let's go get this done. I have many mornings where I'm just like, you know what? <laughs> yeah, mm -mm, not in the mood. But the consistency that I learned through corporate and being able to hold myself accountable is what helps me to still get the work done. Another important lesson for me, which I think is so important for people to take with them, is that, you know, just because somebody's uh, successful or influential, it doesn't automatically mean that they're a good fit for you as a mentor, as a sponsor, or even as a co-collaborator. And so it's so important for you to be very clear about your values, to trust your intuition, because not everyone who pours into you has good intentions or values that are aligned to yours. So be discerning. Curate, curate, curate. Curate who you spend your time with. Curate what you expose yourself to. Curate who you follow on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Are they really adding meaningful value to you or are you just doing it because they happen to be popular or successful or whatever the case may be? But what is the actual benefit for you and is it moving you forward? I love how you mentioned that um, you are not always motivated because I think that sometimes there's this misconception that if you quit your nine to five job and you no longer have an employer and you do what you enjoy, that you're miraculously going to have this high energy, um, you know, every single day and be willing to work. Um, but we're human at the end of the day and you will get tired and you will get demotivated regardless of whether you're working, um, you know, in a normal nine to five corporate environment or you're an entrepreneur and working for yourself. And I think what's interesting to note as well, like you said, is it's so important to mind that internal conversation because then you have to motivate yourself, right? Because you don't have your manager to say, hey, you're doing well, you know, continuously here, well done. You know, you're meeting your KPIs. Now you sort of have to have and manage that conversation with yourself. Even when things are not going that well, you need to keep um, accountable to what you have committed to. So many nuggets. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people um, struggle with that and amongst other things, also being recognized in the environment, which you spoke about. And we're going to be sharing a video on how is it that you can get recognized in the corporate environment? How do you receive that recognition? If you feel like, oh, Sisha, I'm doing all of these things, but I'm showing up, I am, I am saying something in those meetings, but they don't see me, um, you know, and I don't understand why. Sisha is going to be telling us how we can actually be recognized in those corporate um, environments in one of the videos that she's going to share on our Facebook group, Velocity Club Success Seekers. So if you haven't already, make sure that you join that group and you are part of these conversations because they need to continue. It's not an overnight, it's not a one solution fits all. It's not a you hear this now and everything just changes after that, but it's continuous engagements on different areas of your life to get you to the successful point of where you want to be. So lastly, Sikha, for this conversation, I know that you've shared these nuggets and you'll share more as we continue in our group as well. But what are, what are some of the key lessons that, um, you know, a Sikha or someone else has given to you that you felt like, sure, if I didn't receive that, um, you know, back in the day, my life probably wouldn't have turned out this way or my career wouldn't be where I would like it to be. Maybe share some of those interesting lessons that you took away from someone else or for something else that you feel like were really impactful in getting to you to where you are now. Sure thing. Um, I, I, I have so many, I'll share a few, but I just want to preempt it by sharing that <laughs> the interesting thing about the best career advice that I've received is that it never really had anything to do with career, right? Um, and the first one is be loyal to yourself first, always, not an employer, right? Um, the other is don't underestimate anyone because everyone has something to teach you. Um, the third one is do not be humble about your accomplishments. Toot your own horn. Um, another one is it's okay to do it scared and it's okay to make mistakes. That's how we learn new information and new ways of doing things. Um, and another one that's so, so important is leave your ego at the door. Wow. Um, and this is, this next one is also a very, very important one and is really <laughs> the core of my book, We Are The Ones We Need, The War on Black Professionals in Corporate South Africa, is if you're faced with bullies, call them out on their behavior, name it, and document it. I'm a huge advocate for paper trails. 
especially when we so desperately need organizations to stop perpetuating or ignoring abusive behaviors and cultures, because that's one of the biggest challenges that we face in the workplace, and also one of the biggest contributors to mental health issues for people who are particularly within corporate South Africa. So guard your mental health. No job is more important than your well-being. Mm, I completely agree with you. And thank you so much for these engaging nuggets. Guys, I really want to encourage you to continue having these conversations on different platforms. Um, continue trying to discover, you know, what is your next best move, whether that's a career move or it's a financial move because you need that to enable something else. Whatever it is, continue to engage with yourself and with any information that is around you in order to better equip yourself on your journey, whether it's a career journey or a financial journey of like Sisha just mentioned, a personal journey, you know, of discovering and asking yourself these questions. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Sisha. It was truly an intriguing conversation. Please don't forget to fill in that questionnaire and answer those questions. Also, don't forget to join our Velocity Club Success Seekers and be a part of the conversation as it continues. And guys, if you notice that the email we send you for the Velocity Club webinars is ending up in your promotions folder, please make sure that you move it to your primary folder to ensure that when we do send out these invites, you don't miss out on these engaging conversations and you don't miss out on being a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, welcome to the Q&A segment of our masterclass. I'm sure you are burning with questions and I do apologize in advance because I won't be able to get through all of them, but I'm going to try as much as possible. And Sikhe is also going to help me by keeping it sweet and short so we can try and make sure that we cover, you know, um, a lot of the questions. First one I picked up, which is common, is Sikhe, I hear what you're saying. And, um, you know, I really do want to change and improve myself. But how do I build this, my self-esteem? How do I build my confidence? I feel like I know what to do, but I'm not confident enough to speak up. I'm not confident enough, um, you know, to ask the right questions. So before I get there, what are some of the things I can do to actually build that? Well, the process really starts with firstly, writing down, so journaling. Journaling your earliest memory of when you felt like you're not confident. Journaling the earliest memories that you have where you felt not good enough or where you were told that you were not good enough um, or where, whatever the case may be, where you felt that your, your confidence was shaken because that's the root cause that leads to all of these various manifestations throughout the course of our lives. Um, but also it's important for us to spend the time to understand what it is that we believe about ourselves and changing the narrative that we have internally. And when you are in those situations where you're doubting yourself, ask yourself, whose voice is this? And sometimes it might be, that's my mother's voice. That's my father's voice. That's my teacher's voice who used to tell me I'll never amount to anything. And you only then, once you identify what lies at the root, you can begin to change the narrative. And also things like um, meditations, things like affirmations play a huge role in helping you to be able to shift that narrative that you have within yourself. So invest in spending time with yourself, invest in understanding yourself and being your own cheerleader and not relying on external validation to be able to tell you that you're good enough. Trust and believe that you are good enough right now as you are. Um, I completely, I completely agree with you. And I think, you know, sometimes we often say, even in, in my um, sessions with my clients, I often say, have these conversations with yourself. And it sounds weird to say it, um, you know, but encourage yourself, tell yourself, I can pay off this bad debt, I can save, you know, I can, I can put on a plan, it really does help. Um, so try it in building. I think it can be quite effective. So guys, I'm going to group the questions, okay, and not necessarily answer them one by one. The second one is about um, I've been in a job for a couple of years and um, I feel like I've hit a bottleneck and things are just not working out and I'm not happy. I don't feel like I'm adding value and I don't feel like this is working out, but I can't necessarily afford to leave. So what are some of the things that I can do um, in order to take myself out of that sort of uh, depressed and discouraged um, situation? Well, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very broad question because it would require more information to understand why someone would feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important for you to jot down for yourself what it is that makes you unhappy about your current situation. What is, and then you, you can even get a piece of paper and create different columns. 
what don't I like about the situation that I'm in? What makes me unhappy or makes me feel unfulfilled? What would I like to ultimately achieve? Or what is it that I'm looking for? What would make me feel better? What would make me feel like I'm achieving something and make me feel fulfilled? And in another column, we might write down, what can I do to change this? What is within my control and what was not within my locus of control because then you're able to have a more empowered view on your current situation and then are able to come up with different options for yourself sometimes it might mean okay i need to have a conversation with my line manager about my frustrations and consider what different options are because maybe a lateral move to a different department is what is required for me to be able to kind of shake things up a bit and open up that bottleneck that i'm currently experiencing Sometimes it means that the organization is no longer the place for you because you've reached your, your, your ceiling and it's no longer the space that will enable you to continue to grow. And that's okay too. And sometimes, honestly, it really is about, it may seem like it's, it's a frustration that's related to your job, but it may actually be a very personal and internal frustration that you're experiencing. And it appears to be manifesting itself within your career. So spend that time really exploring where the problem actually relies and then what are the potential solutions you can come up with by understanding what you can change from your own perspective um, as opposed to relying on others to change the situation for you. Mm. And, and, and thank you for that, uh, CK. And um, interesting question. I also have some, some thoughts on this one, but I'll let you go first. What are your, what are your thoughts on sabbaticals? Um, you know, taking a sabbatical to just figure it out, um, you know, when you feel like maybe being in this in this right race is just taking a lot of effort and a lot of your time and you're not able to think and really introspect the way that you would like to um, to get to the solution that you'd like. So what are your thoughts on, on taking sabbaticals during your career? This might be a little um, <laughs> controversial, but from my observations and experience, uh, sabbaticals only work for a particular group of people white folks <laughs> they tend to not be affected by taking time away from the workplace and coming back a year or three years later and going right back to where they were and not losing that career trajectory so and and i i completely you know am for taking time out to to gather yourself but i believe it's also important to be able to do so in a way that is not going to be harmful to you in the long run when you do decide you want to go back into the workforce because we also have to be aware of the realities that we live with and that is that already opportunities for 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 us as you know marginalized groups um, are not as expansive as they are for for white folks within the workplace um, and so i think we have to weigh the pros and cons so weigh up your pros and cons um, and if you do come decide to take a sabbatical and you find that you're struggling to get back into the workforce because you've got this gap in your CV where you weren't doing anything, what then are your other options? Explore that as well. What do you then do if the workforce is not receptive to you at that particular point? Um, and, and also guys, financial freedom is a real thing. Okay, and we need to be we need to be um, honest in the fact that some things do require you to have enough to actually make that decision. So how much do you have in savings to, in order to sustain yourself while you take that sabbatical? Can you afford um, six months off without an income to think and to explore? That's the reality of the decision that you are taking. And I guess it's a goal also that you can work towards, right? I always say that I see an emergency fund as buying myself time. If I can save enough to have eight months or a year, then I could sustain my lifestyle and my expenses while doing whatever it is that I want to do. So again, money does play a factor. Um, having savings does play a factor. If you've still got debts to pay, you know, a car to pay for and all of these things, it's going to be very difficult to take a break. Um, so again, have your goals, have what you want to achieve, but also look at what is it going to take to get there? What is the underlying that actually needs to be implemented and executed to put you in a position where you can do that? Another question um, that's coming up quite a lot, and I love this one because I'm, I'm always so interested in many different things, not just one thing, like Sikhe said, there's many facets to who we are and what we do. And uh, people wanna know, I want to make a career change, something completely different. You know, I want to go into the creative arts and leave finance or something like that. 
what are some of the things that I should be doing or thinking about in order to prepare for this career change that is very different from where I am now? Well, understand what is required for you to be able to have that kind of career um, and spend time following people who are in that space um, and people who what that environment is like. Um, invest in obviously the education part of it because you have to be able to build up the skills, right? Um, but it's also important for you to start to immerse yourself in those circles. So find those communities of those people, be part of those conversations, learn from them, but also be visible in those spaces so that when you do decide to make that switch, you're not some random person that just popped out of nowhere. You've already been within those circles. You've already contributed to conversations within that space. People already know that you're passionate about it. And so you're not necessarily having to start from scratch in terms of networking, because you've already been building that up even before you made the switch. And that's one of the biggest things about pivoting career-wise is being able to, even before you pivot, start building up those networks, start building those connections, start exposing yourself to what's happening in the industry, what the trends are, how do, some industries have, you know, um, different groups or communities that they are part of, uh, or professional groups that they're part of, join those groups because that helps you to be able to not start from ground zero because you have a network that you can begin with, people that you can collaborate with, people who may be able to refer clients to you because they trust you because you've been part of their community for a certain amount of time, even before you officially um, joined that particular space. Mm. Um, guys, some people are asking very specific questions with regards to um, finances as well as career. So I'm going to share the link to the questions that you can complete in order to find out what your next best financial move is. And then you can have a session with the consultant to discuss your situation in particular and your specific um, you know, conditions and experience. Because I think circumstance is very important when you talk about these things. And Sitya also mentioned on the career part that it's important to understand what it is that you are going through. So it won't be possible to just give um, one umbrella solution to your situation. You probably have to speak to a career coach um, you know, to really break it down and understand what the root problem is. And you know, some employers also have uh, teams and groups and coaches within the environment that can help, can help you unpack and realize what the root problem is so you can solve it accordingly. So the specific questions, um, we at times won't be able to dive into them, but I definitely encourage you to engage in those conversations, find those resources that will assist you, uh, be it departments or career coaches or wellness groups or um, you know, a financial coach or whatever it is that you need to in order to make sure that you are making those moves. So in saying that, um, there's another question that's coming out quite a lot as well. And I think this is a very famous one if you're on LinkedIn or other social media platforms, and that is navigating management. Um, so, you know, there's some people saying, I do have a plan. I am trying. Um, I am trying to implement. Uh, you know, I walked in here with a goal in mind, but how do I deal with management serving as a ceiling between myself and that success um, that we're speaking about um, and that career of my dreams that I know I can have. It's almost in eye's reach, but um, you know, there's that ceiling that's blocking me from the implementation. And I, I, I saw someone also mentioned corporate bullying. You know, maybe you, know, you being experienced know more about what that is, but how do we navigate those type of situations to make sure that we do get to these goals that we wanna achieve? Well, I, you know, it's important to understand the environment that you're in and what it perpetuates, right? So organizational culture plays a very, very critical role in determining how employees are able to move within that organization. And earlier I spoke about psychological safety within an organization, which also in, creates an environment where employees can have open and honest conversations about their challenges within the organization without fear of negative repercussions. However, there are organizations that 
turn a blind eye to situations like that. There are line managers who are toxic and who do limit the progress of their direct reports. That's the reality that we face. The first step is to be able to have an open and honest conversation with your line manager about what it is that you are wanting for your career, what your aspirations are, and actually asking them how they can support you to be able to achieve the goals that you have for your career. Because it is their job as your line manager to enable you within your role, to enable you to fulfill your role, but also to enable your development. And if they're not doing that, that's a dereliction of duty, which is actually a fireable offense. And so if you're still struggling, every company has processes that you follow if you're having issues internally. So you go to human resources and you explain what your issue is, what your challenges are, and you seek their support or their advice or their guidance. And if you're still not having any luck, there are other, you know, every company has different processes that they follow. For some people, it might lead to them going to CCMA because they really are not winning, they're really frustrated, they're stuck, there's no way forward for them. But sometimes, we have to get to a point where we admit to ourselves that this is not the environment for me. Sometimes it's important for us to acknowledge that, yes, this is my goal for my career and this is where I'm trying to go and, this is, and I know that I can do it, but maybe this is not the right place for me to do it. Wow. And that's okay too. So look for other opportunities, look at other companies, see what else is out there you're not you know, beholden to this particular company. You can spread your wings in a completely different organization um, that will actually enable you and support you um, in the role that you want to, the role that you want to have or the ways in which you want to grow in your career. Don't be so committed to one organization that you stifle yourself and your growth. Mm. Wow, um, so much, so much to think about, um, and so much to explore, no, explore on both internally and all the available options that are there. Um, guys, let's continue the conversation on the different platforms. Let's continue the conversation on our Facebook group, which is Velocity Club Success Seekers. Ask those questions, um, seek the advice that you need, and make sure that you are a part of the solution. Right? Yo, there's so many things that Sikhia said. Do this. You can do that. And I love it when people give that type of wisdom because then it feels like. I've got some sense of control, you know, and I don't have my hands tied. I can also act, can also try this and do different things for my situation. As your last words and in closing, um, I always love takeaways, right? But if you were to sum it up into one thing and I said to you, I want to build the career of my dreams. What is the one thing that if I do nothing else from this masterclass, guys, there's lots of things you can do that you heard here today um, and lots of things to implement. And I'm sure you guys are going to do that. But if, if an individual went to make coffee the entire time and heard nothing, um, you know, and they've just come back now, what is the one thing that they should start doing differently or start doing from tomorrow if they want to build the career of their dreams? Um, I'm going to use an analogy that I often use with my clients um, to share this one nugget. If you take nothing else, take this <laughs> because it'll help you in every space, right? You wake up one morning, you are getting ready for work. As you're walking out the door with your coffee cup, as we do, and you're wearing white, and as you get into the car, you spill coffee on yourself but you don't have time to go back into the house and change it. So now you're quickly trying to wipe everything off. Are you frustrated? You're frazzled. You start driving, uh, you're on the road. And as you're driving, you somehow get a flat tire along the way. And now that adds to your aggravation and the world sucks. Everything sucks. What a horrible day. This day sucks. What a mess. I'm such a disaster. I'm so clumsy. I'm so this, I'm so that. But you have to get to work because there's a, a project or a campaign that you need to launch and it has to launch at a specific time and you're running late, but you can't move. There's nothing that you can do. You're so frustrated. Everything sucks, right? Can't think of anything that you could possibly do to change the situation. It's always so important to pause in those moments where we feel like everything is going wrong. Take a breath and ask yourself, what can I control? in this moment so that might mean okay I'm stuck here and I can't move because I'm waiting for AA so I pick up the phone and I call a colleague 
and I say, I'm going to be running late for these reasons. Um, we need to launch this campaign. So please ensure that IT is ready to go live at such such a time. The one thing that we needed to implement was A, B, C, D, E. Please ensure that that's done. Um, I've CC'd you on those emails so you can access everything with ease. If you need anything else, I can send it by email because I have my emails on my phone. And that completely changes the energy that you have within yourself in that moment because you now feel empowered to do something about it and it calms you down. And the principle of that is a principle that we need to apply to different areas of our lives at all times. Always ask yourself in any given moment, right now, what do I have the power to control and do that? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, trust you to jump back. Uh, I give you an opportunity to just give us one nugget and you make sure that it is fully packed and it has everything we need. Um, thank you so much, Sihle, for joining us. And thank you to, to everyone, um, you know, dialing in. And thank you for the conversation. I think it's so necessary. And in closing, if I can give you one nugget um, from myself um, on behalf of Momentum Velocity Club, is that you need to own your journey. Um, you need to make it yours. You need to ask those questions. You need to engage in those conversations. Nobody is going to do it if you don't own up and you don't have necessary conversations and you don't take the step to start, whether it's to your career journey or your financial journey or whatever it is that you need. You own it and you need to take ownership by taking the action. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Sihe, for the nuggets. The conversation continues on our Facebook group, Velocity Club Success Seekers. Please make sure that you join if you haven't so you don't miss out. And don't forget that if our emails are landing up in your promotions folder, move them to the primary folder so that you don't miss out on any of the upcoming conversation. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.